Greetings, everyone. Grace and peace to you in the name of Jesus. I wish we could be together in person. But what a wonder that we can still connect across the miles to reflect together about big questions like, why the church? In this first talk with you, I want to focus on the basic identity and character of the church and to do so in a way that draws on scripture, some personal history, a couple wise authors, and several powerful images, a womb of joy, the North Star, a body, and a river. I recently had the opportunity to listen in on a conversation, thanks to YouTube, between a dear friend, Croatian theologian Miroslav Volf, and Willie James Jennings, an African-American theologian. They were talking about a theology of joy. It was part of a larger project the Yale Center for Faith and Culture had going in 2014. Wolf asked Jennings, what is joy? Jennings responded, I look at joy as an act of resistance against despair and all its forces. Joy in that regard is work and can become a way of life. The work of joy resists despair and all the ways life can be strangled and presented as not worth living. There's something powerful about a womb of joy that helps to constitute identity, he said. I'm a child of the church, he said. Not every church space is a space of joy, but multiple churches have been places of surprising joy for me, extreme joy, places where I've been stunned by joy. These are several excerpts from an extended conversation, which I'll return to briefly later. But I wanted to headline these comments as I begin this time with you because of how powerfully they surfaced in my spirit as I pondered the question, why the church? I'm a child of the church, Jennings said. There's something powerful about a womb of joy that helps to constitute identity. I'm also a child of the church. Many, many expressions of church, so many in fact, I often wonder where I belong. Let me give you a brief skate through my personal church history to give you a sense of where I come from as a child of the church. My childhood was largely spent in Ethiopia. I didn't have what one might consider a normal church experience. I experienced church in three primary venues. One was in gatherings of the Mennonite missionary family for prayer meetings and conferences. Another was Sunday gatherings at a missionary children's boarding school where I went as a six-year-old. Those gatherings included Mennonite, Presbyterian, Baptist, and Lutheran children and adults, an ecumenical experience. I also experienced church when we worshiped with local Ethiopian groups where the preaching was in Amharic. The Masarata Christos Church, whose name was chosen in a church council meeting in my parents' living room, 
a church that has grown to become the largest church body in Mennonite World Conference. When I was 12 years old, my parents moved to southeastern Pennsylvania. I was suddenly thrust into a conservative Mennonite subculture where congregational life felt awkward and strange. As a missionary family, we visited many congregations where my father preached. We began regularly attending one large Lancaster Conference church, but soon shifted to join another smaller congregation with a pastor who had more than a high school education because my parents saw that none of their children were doing well in the large congregation. During college, truth be known, I mostly didn't attend church other than required chapels offered at Eastern Mennonite University and at Wheaton College, Wheaton, Illinois, the one year I was there. And while in seminary in Pasadena, California, for two years right after college and newly married, my husband and I attended a variety of churches, Congregational, Episcopalian, and Evangelical Quaker because the closest Mennonite congregation was a 45-minute drive away. Over nine years when we served with Eastern Mennonite Mission and Mennonite Central Committee in the former Yugoslavia, now Croatia, Serbia, and Bosnia, there were no Mennonites in the entire country we weren't sent to plant a Mennonite church, but as teachers and peacemakers invited to participate in existing churches. We worked and worshiped with Pentecostals, Baptists, Lutherans, and Catholics. During a time of further graduate study, we spent three and a half years in Evanston, Illinois, just north of Chicago, where we participated at Reba Place Church a Mennonite and Church of the Brethren congregation that had gathered persons from many religious and non-religious backgrounds into a community of households, vibrant worship, and neighborhood ministry. Those three and a half years were perhaps my most formative congregational experience. During 20 years in Harrisonburg, Virginia, we joined Community Mennonite Church off and on interspersed by co-pastoring another congregation for a year and a half and starting two new congregations, one of which is pictured here, Emmanuel Mennonite Church, which included from the beginning the Roberta Webb Child Care Center on the building's ground level, which has served over 25 years some 2,500 neighborhood children from mixed racial ethnic backgrounds a church that sent out the sign that became vi viral, the neighborhood sign. No matter where you're from, we're glad you are our neighbor. While serving as president of Anabaptist Mennonite Biblical Seminary for nine years, Gerald and I were members at Prairie Street Mennonite Church, Elkhart, Indiana. And yet I was rarely there since I traveled a lot, preaching or participating in over a hundred congregations during those years. And now we've moved from Indiana back to Virginia. We're getting acquainted with a local rural church, Springdale Mennonite, near a small farmette we bought. And my membership is in transition. So the question of whether or not I have a church home or am at home in any particular congregation has always been a challenging one for me. Perhaps you can see why. When it comes to the question of why the church, I've always been a little restless and inclined to think outside the box. I wrote an article a dozen years ago called no more church as usual. In it, I asked the questions like, why do we sit in rows looking at the backs of people's heads? Why are we so passive sitting there as if we're watching a performance? 
Why do we hear so few testimonies about the different scripture or prayer or worship or God make in someone's daily life at work or family? Why are the scriptures read like they have no soul, no life, read while people are shuffling bulletins, reading announcements, read like no one is really listening, and why would they? Why do instructions about communion take center stage right at the climactic moment, like file up this aisle, down that one, dip this, hold that, and let it be all prim and proper? A colleague walked into my office some dozen or so years ago while I was working at Eastern Mennonite Seminary, and happily I don't remember who, but I wrote down what he shared. He talked about how going to church was causing him to lose his faith. So much of church is deadly, he said. I'm guessing many of us have felt that way at one time or another, perhaps many times. I know I have. And yet with all the restlessness, even irreverence about how we do church, I am totally a child of the church. Echoing Jennings' statement. Not every church space is a space of joy, but over and over again, churches have been places of surprising joy for me. The church, in a broad sense, and in its local particular expressions, has been, to use Jennings' phrase, a womb of joy, a womb that conferred identity on me. So why the church? How does the church function as a womb, a womb of identity, a womb of joy? The theme text chosen for this study conference is 1 Peter 2, verses 9 to 10. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's own people, in order that you may proclaim the mighty acts of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Peter an impetuous fisherman who became an outspoken disciple of Jesus and a powerful authority about Jesus, is writing to exiles dispersed throughout Asia Minor, exiles who are suffering social discrimination and persecution. He tells his readers, those who've been drawn into the love orbit of Jesus, your identity isn't earned. It is conferred on you. You are chosen royal, holy. You are a race, a priesthood, a nation who are not distinguished by the color of your skin, your church affiliation, your national identity, but by the most thrilling identity imaginable. You belong to God. Not because of your ethnicity, your professional status, your national flag, but by the fact that you have received mercy. You are chosen, not because you're special or right or more pure, but because you knew and you continue to know your need for mercy. You cry out for mercy and you receive mercy. Now, as you live within the love orbit of Jesus, you are made royal and holy. In crying out for mercy when you feel vulnerable to evil, afraid of the future, uncertain about whether you're up to the job, you receive mercy and your identity is conferred. On receiving mercy, you become God's own people, people called out of darkness and into God's wonderful light. There are many things we are not as the church, we are not a membership list, a white Swiss German or Russian Mennonite church, a black Chinese Ethiopian or Karen church, an evangelical or progressive church, 
an efficient, well-organized, smartly structured institutional church, a holier-than-thou, separate-from-the-world tribal church. Of course, there are aspects of all of the above in our ways of doing church, but none of these are what defines our identity as church. We are God's own people who, because of the mercy of God, have been given this identity in order to proclaim the mighty acts of God who called us out of darkness into marvelous light. I'll speak in the next talk about how the question of why the church relates to how we proclaim the mighty acts of God. But now our focus is on the basic identity and character of the church. And to do that, I want to draw on three metaphors, the North Star, a body, and a river. When we ask the question, why the church? One prominent answer is that it's all about basic orientation in a world where most of us tend to quickly lose our bearings. Whether the North Star is a way to guide us toward freedom on the Underground Railroad when fleeing slavery, or when we find ourselves at sea steering a ship across uncharted pandemic waters, basic orientation is the difference between life and death. If you're like me, we are constantly disoriented by competing voices, by the culture wars, by alternative universes conjured up by fake news. We need the church and fellow travelers who have some shared sense of where home is, where freedom and joy can be found. We need the church to keep us headed toward the North Star of God's Shalom vision. I read a wonderful book last month called On the Road with St. Augustine, A Real World Spirituality for Restless Hearts. It was published in 2019, written by James Smith and describes what he calls St. Augustine's refugee spirituality and how traveling as refugees is often what the Christian life feels like. We find ourselves as migrants on a journey, fatigued yet hopeful. Conversion is not an arrival at our final destination. It is the acquisition of a compass And building on that notion, I would add that baptism is like going public about our basic orientation being the North Star, and that our primary sustainer is the Holy Spirit, along with fellow refugees, disoriented, but reoriented toward God's shalom vision revealed in the scriptures. A refugee spirituality doesn't make false promises for the present, Smith writes. It's not a prosperity gospel or about settling in too comfortably here. Instead, the church is more like a tent city, a refugee camp, vulnerable and at risk, requiring a daily walk of faith. We need the church because as refugees, we're aware of our dependence on others to find water, bind up an injured foot, and shelter small children. The church is this migrant family, God's own people, whose citizenship is the kingdom of God. Unlike other restless wanderers, however, we know where home is and how to get there. As God's own people who have received mercy, our basic identity is clear, as is our orientation toward the North Star of God's shalom 
vision found in scripture. A vision for wholeness and harmony, right relations between us and God, right relations within the human family, and between us and the rest of creation. And now another image for the church that describes the ways we are connected with each other. A community of brothers and sisters who belong to each other as a body. The church as the body of Christ. This was an important Anabaptist image. It was also an image the Apostle Paul used powerfully. Like when he writes to the Corinthians about how every part of the body is important. Every part in some way serves the whole, cares for the whole, connects to the whole. It is especially in hard times when we have nowhere else to turn that we rediscover how much we depend on each other to sustain life. More than arguments or proofs about faith, what we're hungering for is hospitality, love, sanctuary, rest. What we long for is true, enduring friendship in the church. The church will fail us in a million ways, writes James Smith, and yet the church is still one of those places in spite of itself where you can count on people to be a true friend present, listening, giving you room where you need it, and not leaving you alone. I love the story of former AMBS colleague, New Testament professor emerita Mary Schertz tells about the joy that arose in a circle of folks who had come together to study the Bible as if your life depended on it. After several days of intense engagement, they concluded with deepened resolve to stand firm in hard times. We are standing in a circle, Mary said. We are not holding hands. We are together, but also separate. We have been together for some significant time and conversation. We pass the song, stand firm, stand very firm around the circle, naming each person present and encouraging them to stand firm. Something happens bodily. Our feet move apart, our hips and shoulders square, our chins lift. We are both still and ready to move. When the song comes to each of us, we dissolve in tears. We feel the earth under our feet. We feel that energy flowing into us. The earth where the bones of our beloved ancestors reside. The earth God created and enjoins us to care for. The histories to which we belong. The earth to which we also will return. We feel the energy around the circle, our brothers and sisters in Christ. We feel the energy of the Spirit hovering over us, strengthening, challenging, comforting. Above all, we are not alone. We are not perfect. A little hard to be perfect with snot running out of your nose. But we are deeply loved, deeply valued. And here is the saving grace, she said. We are more ready to go out, to love more deeply, to lead from our true selves, rooted, responsible, in community, filled with the Spirit. What is joy? Jennings answered, entertainment and Advertisements offer us joy, but that joy doesn't fully take hold. In hard times, when we're focused on survival, the work of joy becomes serious work. That's when we need people around us 
who know how to sing songs in a strange land, people who can make us laugh when all we want to do is cry. The body of Christ. And when I ask, why the church? I like to think of the ways the church is like a river, contributing to the flourishing of the neighborhoods, cities, and farming communities where we live. The church isn't a monument, a brick and mortar building. The church is not static, but alive to the spirit, alive to our present context constantly changing, joining with other people of good faith to become channels for healing and hope in the world. A river has many tributaries, many branches, but only one source and only one goal, writes womenist theologian Diana Hayes. A river flows, sometimes slowly, sometimes fast but it is always steadily seeking its end. We are baptized, writes Hayes, into the river of Christian life and into the service of God. The diversity of our lives, our gifts, professions, distinct congregations and callings is important. But so is the recognition that we are all part of a mighty stream of humanity flowing from God and to God. North Carolina Mennonite pastor Isaac Viegas suggests that when the church participates in movements like Black Lives Matter and other protests against police brutality and systemic racism, it can be a form of contemplative prayer. In prayer, we immerse ourselves into the mystery of God's love for a people who have endured violence far too long. This movement is like a river flowing through our cities and rural communities, offering a baptism of the Spirit, healing and hope flowing through us for the world. Toward the conclusion of the book of Ezekiel, we read of a prophetic vision the prophet shared with the despairing refugee people in exile among whom he was ministering, a vision of a stream of water flowing from the temple. In chapter 47, it begins as a trickle of water and then grows into a vast river that restores fertility to barren dry lands. Stagnant waters become fresh and everything lives where the river goes. Every living creature swarms of fish and all kinds of trees for food whose leaves are for healing. The river of healing flows not from a king's palace, not from the halls of government, but from the temple, the center of worship. The center of worship for the people of God. Why the church? I've given us several images to ponder, rich with meaning. The church as a womb of joy, where identity is conferred as God's own people because we know our need of mercy. The church where the work of joy is an act of resistance against despair. The church as a refugee people who, because we know our vulnerability and need for orientation, band together to seek the North Star of God's Shalom vision. The church as a body, a community of connection, providing genuine friendship and helping us to stand firm and the church as a movement of people who join God's people everywhere to participate in God's mission for the cleansing and restoration of barren lands and lives. May it be so.
by the mercy of God. Amen.